way. Great. Well, thank you so much, everybody, for joining us today for how to create a food and beverage experience to skyrocket your revenue. From Harvest Hosts and Profitable Food Facilities, we're so glad to have you, and we're excited to share a little bit more information about how we can uh, help your food and beverage program. Awesome. And a little bit just to get us started about Harvest Hosts, we are a RV membership platform that connects RVers who are traveling with small businesses across North America for an opportunity to stay at their business for a one night stay. All of the members are self-contained and they're looking for dry camping and looking for unique experiences to spend one night with different small businesses across the country. So we're here today with Profitable Food Facilities just to talk a little bit more about food and beverage platforms, but our programs, but our together our partnership is a little bit more about how you can increase your bottom line and see more revenue back to your business. Being a host on the Harvest Host platform is a really great passive marketing opportunity, as well as a way to increase revenue. Um, our hosts are seeing an average of ten dollars to $15,000 a year just by simply allowing an RVer to park on their land. So we're excited to partner and bring some more information today about food and beverage programs. And I'd love to go ahead and introduce our presenter, our educator, Mike. Mike has completed over 850 projects across uh, North America, Europe, Jamaica, Asia, and the Middle East. He uh, and his program at Profitable Food Facilities is a company that specializes in captive marketing food and beverage operations, including agritourism destinations, theme parks, casinos, water parks, and private country clubs, across many other things as well. And we're so grateful to have you here today, Mike, and sharing your knowledge and experience with us. So welcome. All right. Thanks, Sasha. I appreciate it. Well, welcome, everybody. Thanks for being a part of this um, and uh, this webinar. And I think uh, hopefully we'll provide you some really great information. I think uh, food and beverage is kind of a unique entity in the fact that um, there's not really a great model to say, go and do it like this. Um, Disney one does it one way. SeaWorld does it another way. Um, you know, everybody, those are some of the top dogs that do it, you know, on very, very high levels. So I think we're going to be able to give you some good insight and some ideas about how to make this uh, work in terms of some opportunities that if we're making 10 to 15,000 now. I think with the food and beverage fire, we might be able to get a few more thousand on top of that, Sash. So kind of excited about this. So just a couple things there. I mean, like you said, we've done, you know, uh, I've been doing this for 31 years. I got my degree in restaurant management. Um, and now I've been closing in on, on uh, 61 years old this year. So I've been doing this for a while. Um, like she said, uh, over 850 projects now in 49 states. We've also worked in five continents um, and spoken at over 400 conferences. So as someone who's been a California native for 56 years, I just recently moved to um, Oklahoma. And what I like about this move for me, because we travel so much, is that now I'm in the center of the country. And for instance, today I'm on a plane at three o'clock to go to Philadelphia, and I don't have to spend seven hours on an airplane to do that. I only have to spend four. So I save 27 days of my life um, by staying in Oklahoma instead of in the state of California. So one of the things that's unique about this state that I'm finding is, you know, we all have seen boards like this. And uh, I mean, here's a liquor store one. And Here's one for an attorney. And what I thought was really interesting about this one is that they kind of put them together in the same spot when you're driving down the road, except I think they probably should have switched it where you had the liquor one first and then the attorney instead of maybe the attorney before the liquor. So, but, uh, you know, I have not seen that in California in my 56 years, but I saw it in my first three months out here in Oklahoma. So just thought I'd share that with you. This is one of the projects we're working on. This is called the rig in the middle of the Saudi Arabian waters. It is a four platform um, extreme park with a water park attached. You can see a cruise ship down there that they're gonna have cruise ships coming over, over 800 hotel rooms. It's a $2.2 billion project. And we are working on the food and beverage uh, concepting of them to assist them with getting the sizes right for the buildings, the uh, opportunities to have when you've got you know, 10,000 people on there, how do you get them fed? So, and then of course, if you run out of ketchup, it matters <laughs> because you can't just go to the store and grab it. You've gotta go. 90 minutes inland to go grab that. So we're working on all the facilitation of the food and how to how to get something like this going. It's a $2.2 billion project. 
and uh, should be completed by the end of next year. So Sasha, if you want to plan a vacation cruise around the Dubai Peninsula and just come cruising back, you can come out and check out this party. Um, just one of the pages of the extremes of how they're doing this. Um, there's four architecture teams working on it at the same time, and they want to complete it in the next 18 months. So, so we want to ask you guys, we didn't want you to chop into the chat here. We got a couple questions for you that we wanted to get up on. Is rating your kitchen on a scale of one to 10 of kind of what you have to work with? It's pretty important that if you want to get into this business in, in, into a level that's going to get you above a 7-Eleven, as we say, um, you know, your retail site is a 7-Eleven, right? You're selling items, you have one or two people working, um, you sell chips, you have a, just a person there. But when you're in the restaurant side, you have to have a manager and you have to have be able to purchase food wholesale and to make the numbers work because a retail, what I'll call your store, like when you're selling things there is maybe a 50% food cost or a 50% cost of goods with a 10% labor. Restaurant needs to be in the third 25 to 30% range of food cost, And we can't do that buying chips or buying bottles of soda because if you're doing that for a bottle of soda, you're gonna buy that bottle of soda for $1.25 and I'm gonna ask you to turn around and sell it for $5 because that's four times. And not very many customers are gonna to wanna to pay that. So that's why we need to get into the wholesale part of buying things like fountain beverage where you're buying product for 36 cents for a 24 ounce or a penny and a half an ounce and you're only paying 36 cents for it. Now you can sell it for $2, $3, $4, and your margins come in. And that's why you see every single fast food restaurant sells fountain and doesn't sell bottled beverages. So rating your kitchen on a scale of one to 10, the quality of, on, a, on a scale of one to 10, and what is your signature experience? This is gonna be kind of the theme of today because if we can create a lasting memorable experience that people can have remembering your RV site, and you can go back to your own childhood, Try and remember what was the vacation that you remember. What's the one that still sticks in your mind of, I remember getting ice cream at that place, or I remember seeing that, you know, at this other place. So that's really the key with this is, is finding that one little thing that's gonna, that they're gonna remember sitting there tearing on grandma's shirt to go RVing again. Can we make sure we go to that spot where they did that thing? And I'm gonna share with you some of those experiences that I think you could create that will be, you know, a part of this. So, um, so seeing it's, you know, because we think we, when we treat food and beverages as a bag of chips and a bottled drink, or we can treat it as something completely different. And this is the type of experience that we're talking about that we actually did at one of our farms. So you're familiar with the sunflower festivals that are all popping up now. And what we did is we created a, a, a four hour personal experience in the middle of the sunflower field where you had salmon and salad and charcuterie and your own, you know, kettle corn and, a couple of ciders and a nice little table set up with your own little with your own little RV spot in the middle of this field, and it was a four-hour stint, and we sold it for um, two hundred and fifty to three hundred dollars, and we were completely sold out. And what we came up with that is, it's like you know, this is something that I think it works in something of what you're trying to do because part of it is that you sell a two hundred fifty dollar experience, and then let's say you have another experience that you're only selling for forty nine dollars or something less. Your 250 experience sets the bar of like, well, we don't want to pay that much. Or there are people that do. They want that VIP. Look, these RVs aren't cheap, right? These people are rolling in with quarter million dollar RVs, something you could get a house in 80% of the country for. So they have dollars and they want experiences and they will pay these type of dollars. I mean, we found out we're in Western Pennsylvania in the middle of Nowheresville. And everybody sold this out every weekend. We could only do three of them because we wanted to separate them and make sure they had their own private space but they were completely sold out very, very quickly online. So, it, and, and if you kind of look at it, it doesn't take much to set this up. You know, you, you can put salmons in a, in a in just a regular oven or even your little home oven that you see on TV. You know, the ones that you pop up, that $59 one, you can drop the salmons in there, you can make the salad, you go get the cheese and the charcuterie board. And the next thing, something costs you 60 bucks, $50, you're selling for 250 in the experiential piece. And people will remember this because where else can you go in an RV in the middle of a sunflower field or you know, that some place that's special in your place. I'm even under a tree that has this great special picnic. That's what I mean by custom food and beverage experiences. So let's understand though a little bit what we are. We're a captive market location, right? So we have breweries where people are coming to our brewery or our golf course or our, or our farm, you know, for a period of time and they're kind of locked in. And so, but what happens that makes it hard is that one, we get too many people all at once and we're not quite ready for that. 
we're not in the business of, wow, I thought my farm would have five or 10,000 and now we've got 15,000 and now we got 20,000 or when the one of the wineries we worked with their weekends, they have a line, there's the winery, the line is down that walkway that's, you know, 40 or 50 deep because so many people want something of experiential peace. And then when the line for food gets 40 or 50 deep, no one wants to be in it. Who likes to be in a line with 40 or 50 people in it? Who likes to be in a line with five people in it? Been in Subway when the line's 10 deep, you know how long your sandwich takes, right? So you don't wanna wait 30 minutes. So we have to come up with ways to speed that up and we're gonna talk about that. But understand you're a captive market operation. That means you're usually not open 365. You're usually open a little bit lower. There's peaks and valleys, right? And so we gotta make our margins when we have the, when, when the opportunity knocks. If we're in agritourism, we only have six weeks, right? To do it, we have to close for the other 46 weeks to make this work. So looking into this, that we are a little bit of a different entity. We're a little bit like Disneyland, except we're building the little piece of fantasy land, right? In terms of our food and beverage opportunities. Again, you know, some of the big players in the farm world, where you got Ballos, where they have 28 food concepts and do, you know, a tremendous amount of volume. They had to build a fantasy land and a venture land and a tomorrow land to compete with everything they do, right? So, um, so we have to kind of gear it to what we are. Are we dialing our operations up or down? And we're going to get in more to this as far as that experience piece goes. So this is part of it is that, you know, we can say, hey, we're in the food business because we have these. And we actually are actually anti, this is, it's non-social. So there's no experiential piece with it. If it breaks, you're going to have to find some person who goes, hey, I need my change for the thing that didn't work. And then you're going to have to go solve that. Or you can say, well, it's not my fault. It's not my machine. And then I'm going to look at you and go, well, it's your fault now because you got my money. So, you know, <laughs> I want that thing taken care of. So even if you're selling these products, we like it that you have always a guest experience as part of it. Not just that we're selling it this way. Um, because being in this pre-made biz, you know, where you've got things that you can just go look at that whole product list that's here. That's, here. that's the thing that from the food side, you want to be able to make the product, not just buy the product that way so but the good news is with all this is you know we're, we're really hitting the things that people like right there's higher attendance there's more chances for revenue there's increased length of stay more chances of revenue many people serve our, our service faster that meaning that we can get the, those lines moving quicker and we're going to teach and educate you all on this today about how you're going to be able to do that and then if we can in, if we can get a dollar more per guest what does that mean for every time that you're full for your rv location or you've got everybody there and how can we make sure that happens? They come in Friday instead, or even Thursday instead, that we can keep these people longer. Because the longer they're there, they get bored and they're like, well, let's go to that whatever store they have and grab something. And if we can make that whatever store an experience or something even better, as I get to the end of this, is some ideas, I think you're going to be able to, to really make some additional revenue, much more than that 10 to 15 number that Sasha was sharing with you. So, because I think, you know, again, we see things that um, in our ops that we can get people up to. 20 or 30,000, you know, in a, in a weekend space with, let's say you have a small pool and you've got, you know, cause then you got your whole pool operations and then you've got, you know, nighttime thing where you could do a fresh grill out on Friday or Saturday nights where we call it burger night, right? Just do burger night. Do you understand that people have an RV and they don't want to clean that kitchen? They have no interest in doing that, right? They don't want to, they've got all this stuff and they're like, we just go grab a pizza, right? I mean, they just, that's, that's how that part works. So we want to try to, Go ahead and then get that, but we can't just serve a frozen pizza from Geno's. No one's going to want that, right? We got to serve a quality product, and we'll get into some of those about how we can do that as well. So, how many in and just of being able to produce this, uh, keeping an efficient kitchen, it's steps to the dance. So, if you've got rum over then this side, and you got Coke over on this side, and you're trying to do a rum and Coke, it's really nice to have rum and Coke right there. But if something's over there and something's over there, and you start looking at your steps, that's where this is going to get hard. And then if you've seen your situation where you have an order side and a pickup side, how many of you just put your hand up if you have that? You know, if you've got, a, well, we have an operation, a little concession, and they order here an ice cream place maybe or something, and then they pick up over here, right? So here's the thing with that, just think about it. If you have one POS and the line's four deep, even just four people, and we take an order and it takes a couple minutes, and then we have to fill it, and then we take an order and it takes a couple minutes. But if you just, and you keep sending them over there, two things happen. Number one, if Sasha is the per, I'm the register person, I'm going to hand the ticket to Sasha, and Sasha's going to have to go redo the read the whole order over again, right? Instead of Sasha's the register and I'm a register, and we're both working at the same time. Now there's only two people in each line, and we're fulfilling orders twice as fast. So that's why we don't want to order here, pick up here. We want to do it all at the same time. 
okay, is the goal with that. And then creating the concept. I mean, what do you want to serve? What are the items that people like in these situations? And we always say menu drives design of what you have. So let's say you're going to build a small, small food operations for this, okay? And this is a building that's 20 by 30. And when we say menu drives design, so if you look and see there's a soda dispenser here in the center and there's a nacho machine and there's not much else going on here except a couple service windows and a soda rack in the back. And then here's where you have to learn a little bit about the business. Here's a refrigerator freezer. Okay, that means that it's a combo unit, a small door above and a small door below. That is not a lot of storage for all of the product that you're gonna need. So here's this huge kitchen, right? And all you have is a little two door fridge about the size of your house. So this was really undersized for what they were trying to do. Um, and then you've got ice. So if you look at it as menu drives design, you would say in this design, it looks like we're doing nachos and soda. And that's it. And you know what's going to happen? You're going to come in here and go, gosh, would it be great to have a blender so we can make some smoothies? And would it be great if we could cook something else or maybe have a fryer or two or something? And you're going to get this and the contractor's going to look at you and go, yeah, we can do all that. It's called a change order. We're going to make it all different than what you've done as a design. So when we took that same design and laid it out with one, two, three, four doors of refrigeration, three doors of freezer space, a whole cooking line to here to make smoothies and sandwiches and, and then set up a fresh grill outside and have three POS here. Now this operation can do two to 3,000 a day easily in its same setting where all you were doing was serving Cokes and nachos before, right? So it's not that you have to necessarily change your space, but so you've got to have the equipment to be able to be successful in that space and make that all work for you. Because when kitchens get built, you see this, see this 111 right here, it says kitchen, right? And you go, gosh, I've got this plan and it says kitchen, so it must be okay. <laughs> well, put yourself in the kitchen just for this moment, right? Here's this thing called a fryer. And most fried food is what? Fresh or is it, is it thawed or frozen? Most of your food is frozen. So we go over here and we go, there's a refrigerator and a refrigerator. There's no freezer. So this kitchen's designed without a freezer. And then when the fries are done, where am I supposed to put them? I don't have a warmer. I don't have anything to keep it warm. So I always say to people, even though you may not know food and beverage, right? You may not be a restaurant manager per se, but you're a pretty smart person. Then put yourself in the space and make sure that it works for you. And just at least some of the basic things that if we're going to cook something, we need something to cool it with or heat it with or put it in there. And there's no space to do that. So what I did here is I took this over here, this little corner box here, and integrate it into the concession area, and we we're able to do a full full kitchen line because I only needed about another hundred square feet to make it work, right? And then we just moved the triple sink in there, created some dry storage and some other things so that this thing actually functions in the same amount of space. So put yourself in the kitchen and make sure that it works. And then this is an operation. I love this one because it's it, it, the potential. When I tell you the numbers, it's, it's a little bit exciting and potential of what this is. Here they set it up as an order pickup station, right? So you order here and pick up here. And that's what we were just talking about, that what if we just had more POS up there to do that? Now let's get a little bit into the flow here. All right, so technically this is a pizza operation. So I pull the product from the fridge and then I walk it over here to, uh, I guess it's, it is a work table, it says work table with sink, right? And we're putting together a pizza. What do we need for pizza? We need some ingredients. How about some cheese and some sauce? So at least I can run it through the cooking oven here and bring it over here. So. Problem number one, no cooking ingredients here to put it together. Problem number two, what am I doing when I land this pizza? There's no warmer, there's nothing to hold it in. When you go to Domino's or any place, what are they doing? They're pulling it out of a warmer, right? So that, because that pizza in a box will hold for half an hour, but if you don't give me anything to do that with, then I don't have any, then this line is wrong. And you're not gonna know this until you work it and go, this line is wrong, unless you take it and walk yourself through it to see if you need it. And then, Walk-in freezers, that freezer there, if you go new, would run about twenty-five to $30,000. But all we're doing is doing some French fries and a couple of, we don't need a walk-in freezer, right? We need a walk-in fridge or at least more refrigeration than we have, which is the two doors of all they gave us in here. So I don't need to spend this $22,000. So what we did with it is we created a cook line on one side where we have our fried goods and our funnel cake. On this side, we have a full pizza operation, which is ventless, by the way, and I'll talk to you a little bit about that in a second. Pizza comes to the center, fries come to the center, we put them into the warmer above, and then at the top corner there, we have four POS, four POS 
running with that warmer. And all I have to do is just keep that warmer full. If I just keep the warmer full of a product, you know, just and make it and make it possible that they could we can sell from full registers. This operation did two thousand an hour and eighteen thousand on a Saturday. Okay, one day did more than Sasha wanted to do for you in a year. Right now, not a bad thing. I'm not saying that you have operations that necessarily require for POS for that long period of time. But if your place is full and you've got three or four hundred people in there that are basically there to just go, let's go experience stuff. And you can go put out some really good food, which is what happened here. They were all sitting there at their bench waiting for food. And we put out a set of, of uh, ten, fresh tenders. Okay, We did our chicken tenders fresh. And I, and I watched the person walk over and sit down with their tray. And they started eating and everybody's like, where'd you, where'd you get that? Where, where'd you get those tenders? Oh, they, the fresh tenders. Are and boom, that's how the concession got buried that quickly because they saw the quality of the product that we were putting. We weren't just doing frozen product, we were doing fresh. And so real quick about that, why fresh over frozen? Well, fresh tenders right now are running about $1.50 a pound, okay? Frozen tenders pre-cooked or pre-cooked chicken are running four to $5 a pound. So they're one third the price. <laughs> Number two, they cook much faster because they're fresh. They're at the 40 degrees instead of zero. So I can cook the tenders in three minutes. Number three, it's a much better product. Do taste test yourself, you'll see, right? And then you can start to see that if you've got a small pool or even just a chuck wagon hangout place on the weekends, or if you want to do your own, as we say, um, food cart place, right? Where you're the food cart. That's the trick with this. It's not someone else's cart, it's yours. Run your own cart, right? That you can set up these operations yourself because the pizza here, the pizza oven that we do costs um, $15,000, 15 dollars the setup for this is about 20, about 20 to 25,000, you're in the pizza business. It's that easy. Ventless, you don't need any hoods. All you need is a space about 100 square feet to 150 square feet, and you can be in the pizza business. Okay. Now, yes, you have to have your triple sink. You have to have your mop sink. You have to have your drum dry storage and other things to support you in a commissary or what have you. But your actual pizza operation can be done in a very, very small space. Mike, on that note, somebody asked, Terry asked in the chat, what does a 50-50 size kitchen like that cost? So this full kitchen here, we're talking equipped and we do, so we have, do have one hood system here, but we can do that even on a low side. Um, this is probably fully equipped about 100 to 120 for this for this particular layout. Um, and that's all in. So that's, that's uh, and that allows you a menu to do pizzas, tenders, fries, nachos, smoothies, um, and everything comes out fresh. And when we were doing that 20,000 on the weekend, our food cost was running about 3,000 of that. We we're only running about 18% cost of goods because things like shave ice that cost, we sell for $5, it costs us 30 cents. Fountain beverages that we're selling for $4, it costs us you know, 45 cents. Our average worked out to about 20% cost of goods. So there's a really good return on these two um, when they're set up the right way. That's a great question and keep those questions coming. So unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to share with you this great magic bullet where you just go, you know, if you just do this, everything's going to be great. It's much more of you have to kind of make a decision and a commitment of, okay, I understand what he's talking about with fresh products because they're less expensive. You're going to have to put some capital into a building. And what would be the thing that I want to start with first, right? And so we'll give you some, as we talk through this, we'll give you some guidance on that and just keep the questions coming, like I said. So this is an operation that we worked with on the top. If you go to Colorado, go way up to the top of the hill on a gondola, I had to go all the way to the top of the hill on a gondola. He had a, a, some caverns up here that they were doing, you know, basically day passes for, and then he had a restaurant that for 10 years had four different concepts, completely failed, never made any money because no one wants to go up a gondola to go to a dinner, right? That takes half an hour to go to, that's at 9,000 feet. Beautiful view, but the concept was off. They were trying to do it formal. None of us want formal anymore. So we made it into an upscale casual, where you were able to, you did counter service, sat down in this beautiful restaurant, and then we built this outdoor grill operation, which we completed. It was really great. The contractor handed him a check for a quarter of a million dollars that was dated May 15th. And he had, and that was the, the 90th day on the check. So if he could cash the check up to May 15th. If he brought it in May 16th, he lost a quarter million. So this building was constructed in 75 days, and he had that check on May 14th and put it in the bank because he wanted to be open Memorial Day weekend, right? And so if you look in the lower right-hand corner here in the red shirt, that gentleman there is the owner. 
and he was actually grilling on opening day, listening to all the feedback of every saying, this is so great. And he went from Memorial Day weekend was 12,000. He went to 27,000 each of the days. We did over 81,000. He did 36 the year before by putting these concepts in. We paid for this building in the first season of his ROI. So once you have the right concept and the right food and the right experience, because what's happening now is this is year three and people are coming back again and again because they go to the down to the caverns down below and get this great food experience at the top of the hill. So always you can always adapt with what you have and make something better. And as you said, you know, Memorial Day weekends, we had 38,000. The average wait was over an hour to get food in the restaurant. And we cut the wait down to about 12 minutes. We also uh, doubled the tips of the servers, um, the way that we set this up as well. And there's a whole story around that, but just letting you know the servers made, because I had a girl there who was 22 years. And she's like, why are you changing our concept? And we did full service and da da da. And when we changed it to a counter service, she was making $2 a table times 12 tables, that's $24 instead of four tables and trying to make, you know, three to five dollars for each of those that she had to wait on and do all the service steps and all. And then they turned so much quicker. So she came to me afterwards and gave me a big hug. And I said, I didn't believe in you, Mike, but it really worked. And it's really great that you were doing all that. So uh, it's really neat to see our stuff, you know, as it comes together and, and do that. And so also their per caps doubled in one season. Uh, so that's the, that's the, the most exciting part from all ends. Everybody wins, including the customers and yourselves at the same time. And then just in general, it's not, there's nothing wrong with having a retail store and selling bottles, right? I don't have an issue with that because it's in its own space and it's doing its own thing. Just like a 7-Eleven makes a business, there's nothing wrong with it. But do you see the number of selections they have there in terms of flavors and choices? Look, two Gatorades, okay? Red and blue, that's all you need. Do you have orange? No, we have red or blue. This is why I call it captive market. So you have a choice, red or blue. Would you like red or blue, <laughs> right? And you know what they're gonna do? They're gonna pick one of those. It's gonna be great. So you don't have to have red, blue, orange, yellow, green and all these different flavors because then you have to, case, have to have a case of everything and then you're gonna start to learn that the orange doesn't sell, all right? And then you're just gonna end up with orange because that's all that's left. <laughs> so just sell the two that are the most popular. Um, and uh, the drink guys wanna sell you everything. Okay, but all you need is just a couple of, you can have this fridge with basically eight different things and you'll be set uh, and everybody will be happy as you do that. So just minimize your, minimize your bottles and minimize your inventory because um, every item has to have a backup, like we said, and then, you know, just seeing how they, how to utilize this. Um, you know, water and fountain is the best, always will be, and, and you don't have to even have branded water. Uh, I wouldn't get Costco brand, but I would get like a crystal geyser or something like that. Just ask your water guy. You don't have to get it from Coke or Pepsi. Um, you can get water on your own and you should be paying about seven to $8 a case for the 16 nines and about $11 a case for the 20 ounce sport bottles. If you get it through Crystal Geyser, which is 25 to 45 cents a bottle that you could sell for two to $3 easily. Okay, that's why you wanna go that route. So this is the pizza oven that we were talking about that is that came on the market right in COVID and it's kind of part of why you may not have seen it. Um, Here's the beauty of this. Number one, it's ventless. Number two, it'll do 10 seven inch pizzas. So 10 perfect little seven inch individual pizzas in less than two minutes. So you can fill this with 10 pizzas, push the button, close the doors, and set two minutes later, you have you know 10 pizzas and that's the one that you put in those warmers on those busy days. Or what about pizza delivery? I'm just gonna leave it like that. Because to me, this is one of the best, best, best opportunities that you have that if you've got 50, 100 or 150 spots and you can get 20 to 25 percent of the people to get a pizza from you delivered, isn't that, you know, and you've got 30 to 45 minutes to do it and your oven does the pizza in three minutes, you're set. And it's good, by the way, this is not a poor quality product. So they have 500 degree heat with 20 percent microwave technology at the same time. You will find this oven online right now for 19,600. 19.6 from K Tom and Web Restaurant and all those spots. And so I was so frustrated with that that I went to Turbo Chef directly and I said, I need to get a price for our customers. It's better than Web Restaurants charging. And so we get them for 15.9. So if this is something that you're interested in that we can help you with, great. You're welcome to look online or anyone else's pricing. I haven't seen it under 20,000 in a long time. And we're just trying to be a help to our customers because I would send them to these places and then they charge them this much and I'd get a lot of sense. I mean, why are they charging you so much? It shouldn't be that way. So we at least kind of got a lot price that we can help you with on that um, if you choose to go that route. 
There are also portable walk-in companies in terms of solutions. So they can make one of these walk-ins for you in less than four weeks and drop it at your, at your door where you can have it as a separate entity. It can be integrated into your building. And what we found out as well is we can make these into concepts. So I can have a fridge on one side, 10 by 10, and then a pizza concept in the center um, as part of the building and make it all actually framed out and set up as a workable concession stand. And you could pop one of these up in four weeks. Okay. So keep that in mind that it doesn't have to be this massive construction project or anything crazy. It can actually be something pretty relatively simple that will ROI easily in one summer or one season for you. Not something that's going to take three to five years to pay you back and you get walk-ins out of it. You can even do full commissary concessions out of this as long as you have septic uh, to set it up. So lots of opportunities with this too. We just came across this company about two weeks ago and we're super jazzed. I've already moved two walk-ins with them uh, for our clients because I know of ones that need stuff now. And if you order a walk-in right now, it's three to six months, right? Plus you have to have a walk-in guy and a refrigeration guy. You plug this in three hours later, you're running. You have your walk-in operating in three hours after the electrician puts in the 230, 220 voltage. So it's really a really good solution for, and again, don't get lost in the color because you can do anything with that color. You can do it as a whole theme of your, of your operation or your RV park or your whatever you want it to be. So it doesn't just have to be gray and, you know, gray and orange like that with trees around it. It could be anything you want it to be. Here's the thing that's not as good in terms of the concession world because we have too much volume to handle some of these. Perfect Fry is a fryless option, but it only does five pounds of fries an hour. And the quick and crispy, unfortunately, we call it the slow and soggy because it just doesn't work quick enough for us to what we want to do. So some of these things, again, you get is to see that it's a fit for you. If you're going to do more than five pounds of fries an hour, which if you want to do anything in business, that's not very much, right? That's like 10 orders of, of fries. And you, if you want 20 or 30, too bad, it's going to be another hour. So that's why we have to spend a little bit sometimes on the on the fryers to get that piece set. But fryers only run a couple of grand, and we found a hood company that we can put in for less than two thousand a foot. Even attach it to the inside of the building with just a single vent outside, and it's self ventilating, and it can be put in in four weeks as well. So we're finding some really neat solutions to help help our customers and clients so that we can get these things in instead of just talking about you know doing pizza. Well, wait, here it is. Here's the piece where you buy the oven. Here's where you buy the cheese. Here's where you buy the sauce. Here's literally turnkey this for you in a matter of you know weeks that you could be operating and making this thing a go. So the whole fresh thing is, is being able to get products that, you know, bread fresh tenders, ordering fresh wings. Um, so in my days at Chili's, what I found out is that we would take the wings fresh and we would blanch them off and cook them off almost completely and then hold them the next day. And I have cooked chicken. And as you know, cooked products hold very well. And we take eight wings and re recook them, which you would think when you double fry something, it's not very good, which I would not do with any other product except wings. Because what happens with the wing when it's raw is it's all kind of gooey and chewy. But when you have it and you cook it the second time, that skin wraps around, it becomes crunchy. That's how you have a crunchy wing versus that. Kind of that it's it's fresh tasting, but it's just kind of the skin is all ugh, it's weird, right? So um, and then just when you're doing hamburgers, is being aware that Jamie Oliver exposed this about eight years ago that they were adding what's called FTBs to beef, and it's finely textured beef is a terminology that's grinding bone with fat and putting 11 percent of that into your ground beef. It's it's awful. Um, does not taste very good, and you're and it makes your it, as they call it slime, the terminology used to be that they're sliming our beef. It literally looks like slime when it's put into it, along with other additives as well. Point being, ask your specific rep, I want 100% ground beef in my product, no additives, no FTBs. And you'll have to go back to the manufacturer to see whether it is a made that way. There's only about 20 to 30 cents a pound more for fresh ground beef. It's not that much different. So for the sake of, because what all, all I know right now is that our country is getting bigger and bigger and all we keep hearing about is obesity rates can keep going up. And I to look at stuff like this and I go, I wonder why. If we're adding products like this, no wonder that stuff is happening. Whereas in Asia, it's 3% that we have obesity in Asia. We have 54% in the United States and growing. So for our own livelihoods, you know, and sustainability, this is something to look into to make sure we get 100%. Um, and just watch your pre-cuts. I mean, I'm fine on getting like shredded carrot, something like that is, is understandable. But um, if you've ever worked with pre-cut tomatoes, it, it, they're, they're awful. <laughs> Try them once if you really want to, 
but look, it's a knife and a tomato slicer or it, reach out to me and I know a slicer that we can do uh, a tomato this quick. I do, I put it in the, the holder and I, go to, I rotate one time and your tomato has nine slices, okay? So if you're doing higher volume, just reach out and we'll give you that, that spec on getting that specific tomato slicer that works. Not the one the handhold that goes through that jams your stuff and you get cut fingers all over the place, okay? Not that one. Um, it's a different type of tomato slicer. So you're familiar with Canes, you know, all of their products are fresh. They have fresh lemonade, they have fresh tenders, obviously their signature sauce that they have. So, you know, this is the opportunity, kind of what you want to be. And remember, that's all Canes does, right? That's all they do is chicken tenders and coleslaw and, and toast. So, um, and they're busy all the time with one product. So be thinking about that, that our menus don't have to be so crazy as we talk more about this as we move forward. So, um, you know, and this is pizza. The top right is pizza that we we were messing with, with the wrong pizza dough. The bottom left was something that our customer is serving in the top left corner picture. That's the seven inch and the 16 inch pieces that come out of that pizza in two minutes flat. So pretty exciting to see, you know, what, how quality makes a difference. We go, well, I, I would, I would buy that. I'd pay $8.95 for that individual pizza with a drink, right? And if you do that times the number of customers you have, it's kind of exciting what we can do in food and beverage. That's what we sold as far as our knife burger at the top of the hill for the for the uh, adventure park up there. And we sold that burger for $16.95, just like that. And if you wanted a beer, it was $18.95. So, and that was definitely the number one seller. But see the presentation, not just a burger in a bag or a burger in a boat, right? Just adding a little bit of touch. Even the knife itself is just a really nice add-on to give that quality and appearance of what the product is. So, I always say this a little bit. One of the things about hot dogs is that, you know, we kind of get kind of sucked into this. We're opening our operation and maybe we're doing what I call crockpot hot dogs. And we got like 30 of them in a crockpot because we got a couple thousand people at our farm. And then we get a lot of calls from farms. They go, yeah, our attendance went from 2,000 to 10,000. And, and I think we're going to do 15 next year. And we're still doing hot dogs in a crockpot and we're kind of struggling and it's getting hard. And it's like, yeah, that's, that's going to happen because we got to we got to move out of that into something new so we can, you know, really generate some revenue out of this because that's not what you want to be known for, right? Ballparks is what hot dogs is where hot dogs are supposed to be sold. And just so you know, hot dog meat and hamburger meat is about the same price right now if you buy it wholesale. So hot dogs are running about four dollars a pound. Ground beef is running about four fifty a pound. Um, and then the perception: if I sell a hot dog to you for ten for eight dollars, and I sell a hamburger to you for eight dollars, you're not going to yell at me about the hamburger price, but you sure are going to yell at me about the hot dog price. So that's why we just say let's let's stay out of the hot dog business. Look really close at this in the top left. You'll see hot dog, and it's under the in the white area, and it says two fifty, and everything else is five to five fifty. I sat at this stand, this concession stand, for an hour, and I watched nine customers come up and eight of them ordered the $2.50 hot dog, right? And so when I said this, I said, you know what happens? What would happen if I just took out the $2.50 hot dog? There's two things that'll happen. A, they'll pick something else, or B, they'll walk away. And I can tell you that if I just take the hot dog out of there, they're going to do A, because the next closest place is four miles away and they're losing their parking place, okay? So they're going to just get something else and you just doubled your revenue on the piece of, of, of the pro, of the item that you're selling. So that's why hot dogs to me in this sector don't work as well where I've got everything else at a price range that does. Three things that are really important when you have any menu item. It's got to be a good quality item. Don't serve something that's marginal or something you go, yeah, I mean, I, I love to do this all the time. You know, someone brings out some nachos where they have pre-made chips in a bag and the cheese is in a container. Right, and, like, and I go, what's that? They go, oh, that's our nachos. I go, so what would you give that on a scale of one to 10? Well, I'd give it a five or a six. I'm all, so you give it a D or an F and you're serving it. Why are we doing that? Like, if you think it's a D or an F, what do you think our customers think, right? So what can you do with those nachos? Well, you can go get fresh made chips, drop them in a fryer for 30 seconds and you've got fresh chips. And if you've had the difference, you've been to many Mexican places where you have the hot chip that you're eating with the salsa, that's fresh chips that they actually make. They don't do pre-mades in the back. They, they fry up the chips. And by the way, the chips are one fourth of the cost, right? So you're gonna pay you know, three or $4 a pound for chips. That way you'll pay 75 cents a pound if you fry them yourselves. Okay, so your cost of goods is gonna be way down, your quality goes up. So it's gotta taste good. It's gotta be fast. So don't do fresh chicken wings from scratch because they take 12 minutes. It's not gonna work, right? That's where I said, blanch them off three minutes and it's ready. And that's gotta make you money. I have a lot of people that have tried to sell pizza by the slice. 
So how many of you would spend over $4 for a slice of pizza? Not very many of us. But remember I was selling that little individual? We're selling that individual for $6.95. Do you know what the size of that individual pizza is? About a size of a slice. They don't complain about it because it's in its own little box and my own little private thing. And I got everything that I wanted on it, right? The other thing about pizza, when you see it in a whole pizza out there, it's sitting there, what happens to it? It gets old, it doesn't look very good. It's sitting under a heat lamp. Then they go stick in an oven for a little bit and try and give it back to you. It's like, oh, great, manufacture my pizza again, thanks, right? No, just shove it in, when you keep it in a warmer in a box, you can keep it for half an hour that way. So if it doesn't meet one of these criteria, it's off the menu. So something that doesn't taste very good, even though it's fast and profitable, don't serve it, okay? Just keep it, keep these three things in mind. And then just as far as items that have good margins and items that don't have as good margins. And I had someone who, when they looked at this list, they go, Mike, I have all seven things on the right-hand side and I only have one thing on the left-hand side. So what we want you to do as you're thinking things through is let's move off of the right and let's move over to the left. So I don't wanna see, we don't wanna have pre-made pizza that's all frozen, ready to go with cheese and sauce already on it because they're gonna cost you $6 and you can make your own pizza for two bucks. Okay, you don't need icy, you can do your own shave ice. Or even better, you can get a slushy machine that it's a frosty machine uh, that will make cider slushy or, or what we did with strawberry lemonade that the season we couldn't get cider slushy. We were, the products cost us about 40 cents and we were selling them between five and $6 all day. No complaints at all, okay? You can get it and this is really, we've proved this more in the farm piece that a lot of these products which we got from the farm's ideas and we actually manage those operations ourselves to see how we could make funnel cake, how we make fresh donuts. I mean, think about think about at your RV park, if you were known in, on Sunday morning that you were doing fresh donuts every Sunday, right? But they knew between only between seven and eight, or they pre-sell them in advance, but they have to, if you want, we only have 50 of them, how many people, you know, when we sell out, we sell out, right? And you just pay another three or $400 selling a half dozen donuts that costs you, you know, eight cents a donut. So is there a setup for that? Absolutely, but there's, but there's return is, is really, really great. So um, not being afraid to sell alcohol, having a great bar out there, even having music out there, karaoke, whatever the things, again, just bringing people together so that they can buy things. But keeping everything on the, on the left side is better than keeping things on the right side. Hopefully you don't have one of these many boards. These were brought out in the 1990s. Okay, and Coke still offers them to you. So please, look, you can do a vinyl board right now with all sorts of pictures and everything else for much, much less, um, uh, but that'll create a much more of an impact. This was actually a TV board that we worked with a client on and we spent an hour and a half rechanging this because it's just selling individual items, okay? Because you want to sell combos. That's why I always say, sell the pizza with the drink. Right. If someone wants a pizza to drink, it's $8.95. You want just a pizza, it's $6.95 for just the pizza. Wow, Mike, that's not a really good deal. I know you should get it with the drink. You should get a combo because we want per cap, right? We want more dollars per person. So packaging things together. So watch what happens when I patch this thing together. I want you to look at this for just a second and take your time and guess what the number one selling item was. Take your time. Right. Okay. And all we did is we took a grill outside and we bur we cooked those burgers off on burger night. And we sold over 200 of them, right? Because we promoted it when they checked in. Hey, guys, tonight's burger night. It's going to be $6.75 for a combo there. That combo cost us about $2. And all I do is have a guy cooking off grills. And even with, with, with the chips that I had in a regular way, if I could do fries, I would, right? And having a drink combo there, it was just like this. And so this operation, we did this. This is out of a small bar ballpark in Grapevine, you know, Parks and Rec is right by Dallas. Um, their operations went from 286,000 to over $700,000, okay, within two seasons of us inter, inter, interjecting these ideas. So fresh grill, creating a fresh grill experience outside, creating the combos for them, because in the end, it's just easy for a guest. You don't have to build it, just go, give me that thing in the center, right? Just give me that thing in the center. It, it, it doesn't matter. And whether that's a seven now or an eight or a nine doesn't affect people either, right? So think it's, it's the experience. I get to get a hamburger off the fresh grill over here, Mike. RV park and I don't have to pull out my grill. This is great, I'm doing this. So that's the idea of that. And then you can see the difference between a fresh hamburger and a frozen hamburger. You can see the lower left-hand corner where it's red and juicy. See that other thing where it's kind of white and weird? Um, that's 
frozen, the average frozen hamburger, ladies and gentlemen, is in the freezer for 18 months before you receive it. You want to know why during COVID we didn't run out of ground beef? Because we didn't, even with, with farms closed for months, beef plants were closed for months, and we still never ran out of frozen hamburgers. Every fast food chain was still open, weren't they? Right? That's why, because we have such a great supply of it. Wendy's had a little bit of issue for a couple of the stores for their fresh ground beef, but that was about it. That's what a fresh hamburger should look like. So that's why I like to not, I don't even know what's in that hamburger. I don't want to know what's in it. I'm going to get my own fresh hamburger. Eight ounces on the left, four ounces on the right. So if you want to make a nice big eight ounce burger, I don't have a problem with that. Just get two four ounces and double stack them together and see how much quicker they cook. That's why we want to have it as four ounce burgers double stacked, right? If you double stack them that way, you can still get an eight ounce if you want to, but then, then this is a, all those are fresh and the ones on the left are frozen. Same cook time. I've had them on for the same amount of time. See how much longer it's going to take for that frozen to cook up. Okay. And remember that now the burgers are coming in cryovacked. So you're not, I'm not asking you to sit here and patty burgers, guys. That's not what I'm saying. You can buy, you know, four ounce or 3.2 ounce, they call it five to one burgers um, that are all pre-pattied for you. Okay. And they're like 450 a pound instead of 420 a pound, which is eight cents a patty. And they do it all for you. They're crowd backed and they will hold for over two weeks. Okay. So my thing too is like just getting your own little smoker for $2,500 and doing pulled pork, doing pulled, pulled porks, pulling the pork, you know, along the pork meat holds three weeks. Okay. You don't have to do pulled pork every day. You can do it three weeks in advance. So, um, and then really understand too about why we want to consolidate meals. There's 365 days in the year. That's three meals. It's 1,095 meals. And how many meals are they going to be eating at your location? Maybe one, possibly two. Okay. So you don't have to have big menus. You might want a big menu, right? Because you want to have variety, but to be, the customers are only there for a couple of days and they're gone and the next ones are in. So we don't have to have these because then if you have more menu, you have more items, you have more items, you have more inventory. And then it kind of sells. As I always say we sell a bunch of nothing onesie twosies. Here's what we do. We do it really well. And I'll show you a picture of this menu in just a second of what we do. So this is the menu that we did at the farm. We had a cheeseburger combo. We had the hand battered chicken tenders. We had the pulled pork. The Barnwelly burger was two patties with pulled pork on it. Super yummy burger. And then we had salmon. And a lot of people are like, salmon, Mike, we're in Western Pennsylvania, why are you putting a salmon on the menu? Well, number one, I just got a 1395 menu item and that is now 1595, by the way. Now, where can you go get salmon fries and a drink for 1595 at any restaurant? Fresh grill. Number two, we, under, we, we cook the salmon medium, okay? So if you come and say, hey, this salmon isn't cooked. Oh, no, no, ma'am, we cook our salmon medium. Now, if you would like it a little more cooked, we can cook that up for you right? It's served skin side down. It sits on the broiler for half an hour and it's, and it's like smoldering because the skin is blocking it, literally steaming it. So it's super yummy. And what happens is if you have an operation that's a summertime, we see a lot of people like maybe in June, they're not ordering it very much, but by August, when they've tried all the other items that are all super yummy, they try the salmon as well. And what it came is the owners were the number one buyers of the salmon. So <laughs> they got one every day. You notice how simple this menu is though. You notice that there's only combos. You notice that there's the only thing we have is a kid's menu, one item, one option for the kid's menu, not three, not five. I'm not sitting here making peanut butter and jelly for them. They can do that in their van, okay? I got chicken tenders or nothing, choose, right? Just, just keep it really easy, really, really easy. And no matter where you are, if you're in an RV park, kettle corn is a wonderful thing to do. Kettle corn costs you 40 cents a bag. You can sell it for $6, $7, $8 all day. Or everybody that checks in gets a free kettle corn. And that's just, again, that memory thing of like, wow, that's so nice to give something free. Yeah, I just gave you something that was 40 cents. I hope that I, but I raised my rate by $9. And, and it includes a free kettle corn, right? So however that works for you in terms of marketing, if food becomes a part of that, I think that's a great idea. And so it's creating this memorable experience. So there is a new concept in town that across the central U.S. called chicken and pickle. And this is what a chicken and pickle place looks like. So they have pickleball in the top left corner. I would highly recommend. It's very inexpensive. To put in a, you can put one tennis court in or four pickleball courts in. And if you had four pickleball courts at your RV place, I promise they would be full all the time because it's the fastest growing sport in the U.S. If you haven't done it, go try it. It's like ping pong on a court. Super fun. Now, 
They have five indoors here, five outdoor courts. You see the green area over here where everybody's hanging out, this green spot. This is something that's really neat because they've got cornhole and they've got a, a, a bar out there and they've got, you know, just a place to hang out and be with friends, right? Yes, they have a stage if you want to, if you've got live music going on as well, but this artificial turf space is jammed all the time. And if you just have shade nearby and keep it there and, you know, they have giant Jenga, they have giant battleship. It's just fun, right? Everybody wants to just be at this place. These guys are building these for $15 million and are ROIing in three years. And it's one guy who owns this. This is not a franchise. This is one guy who's popping around the country, popping in $15 million operations right now in Oklahoma City, in Kansas City, in Denver, in Dallas. He's putting one in Vegas this upcoming year. Check it out because what he's creating is what you want to create, an experiential place where people hang out for three or four hours and don't just have one drink. They have three or four, which is just fine over four hours because they're not going home drunk. They're going home having a couple of cocktails and they're not intoxicated. Right. It's when you go to a bar and have three or four drinks in an hour is where we get in trouble. So where I just hang out for the day with my family is a lot of the key components here, I think, is something that we can definitely use. So just a few shots of what these guys do and what their nighttime experience looks like. But they are crushing it and just having, you know, lots and lots of people involved. As they say, 10, they're only generating 10 percent of the revenue from pickleball, but 90 percent of the experience from the pickleball experience. So watch it. Go see it. Go learn from it. And I think it's something that, geez, for a slab of concrete and adding a net to it with a couple of lines, there's not very much to do, you guys. And it can really, really help you. So just kind of summarizing what we went through today, not selling pre-made products. And um, I, I, what we're going to do is, Sash, we're going to give this list to you to send out to them tomorrow so they don't have to really run these all down or take a picture of anything. We'll have these for you. Um, understanding captive market, what the proper equipment can be, efficient kitchen, getting some health. Again, my thing about this is, you know, we, we can't be great at everything. And if we can get some expertise and, or just running ideas by us, that we, don't, we don't charge for that, you guys. Just call us up because, hey, I'm thinking about this menu item. And I'll be like, that's a great item. Or I'll be like, yeah, that's on that. Remember that right list we showed you? You don't put it on that list. So, you know, we can talk you through this. Again, with the, we have, I mean, Josh, first who's worked for me, we opened 14 concepts last year. You know, just being able to help people concept develop and, and then we get the results of that. So we get to share all that with you. Okay. And then ordering pickup at the same time, we talked about minimizing the bottled options to minimize your inventory, use the technology, that oven that we have, other things that we can do. Um, the fresh is cheaper than frozen. And then just again, staying away from hot dogs when there's other options. And let's see. there we go. Sorry, got that degrees. And then menu engineering, how we laid out the menus. Remember, we had just the pictures, right? And just the combo pictures of that. So time your cook lines and, and, and time your cook times and your lines. So just sit there with a stopwatch and just see how long a transaction takes and see how we can potentially speed that up. Following the formula of taste, execution of profitability, looking for those low cost high, high margin items, and then simpler menus as we discussed and creating an experience. So what I'm gonna wrap this up with and showing the experience piece is, if I can get this thing to work, there we go. Um, thinking about right now, what are you known for? What is your signature experience? So we talked about these, but I think there's potential for all of these. You know, I, I worked with a park that, an RV park that was, they made their own fresh cherry pies. And I was like, you need to give one of these to every single person that checks in. And you will be known that, that how much that pie cost you? Back then it was like, they're made it for $2. And I go, okay, go raise your rates five and go give everybody a free, a free pie. Because whether you're 59 or 64 a day is not impactful to somebody staying at your RV park, okay? Those, and don't be afraid, by the way, to charge what you charge, okay? Because that's, that's not what, but it, especially when you're providing fresh delivered pizza, with a fresh cherry pie and maybe an ice cream experience. I put this in here. I'm not a fan of hard pack ice cream being crowded. If you've been to 31 flavors and it's busy, it's not fast, right? But if you're a constant, you're gonna open this up after four o'clock. I wouldn't do shakes with it, do shakes with your soft serve. But again, I, I know as a kid, this is what I remember about, about an RV park was this, um, was being able to get that scoop of ice cream at that place. So I didn't wanna not say it. You just have to be smart with it because this ice cream is not fun to work with, okay? Hard pack ice cream, 
I started my first job at, at 31 flavors and it's, it's not an easy thing. So, but it has its place for you. So I, I think it's important that I share it, but the, the pie paste, the, the pizza delivery piece, I think you have huge opportunities with that along with those charcuterie type of experiences. So we always say, you can take in this and have a day or, and say, well, I was really neat. You had some good things to say, but if you always do what you always did, you always get what you always got. So you'll do how you do in food and beverage. But I think if you take some of these things on, you can be at a whole new level. So um, I think the thing for us is, is uh, you know, being able to, to read, if you have questions about us, somehow this isn't popping up right, but it's, it's mike at popofood.com. Um, you're just reaching out for any questions that you have or anything like that we can take care of. We're happy to, to educate you and help you in any way that we can. So, um, but let's take some questions and see what we got there, Sash, about what, uh, what answers we can have for them. Yeah, feel free to submit any questions. We have a couple here we can start with. Um, two different ones are specifically asking about the equipment you're talking about. So is the best way to send you an email? They're interested in certain equipment you were talking yeah, about. Yeah, I, I don't have the tomato slicer off the top of my head. So I, I need to, I'd have to go look that one up. Um, and then, but definitely just send me an email and I'll, I'll let you know which one that is. Um, just can't, I know we just looked at this a couple of weeks ago, but just send me an email and I'll, I'll get it to you. Get Mike at Proper Food. So, and then a $6 grilled cheese. There's no problem with a $6 grilled cheese. And let me tell you about this though. You can probably get eight or $9 for that grilled cheese when you combo with fries and a drink, number one. And number two with that grilled cheese, I think that there's opportunities to, um, do that with different equipment because we were at a farm that was doing grilled cheese and our team was studying it because we're like, can we add this in, right? And what we saw is it was still slower, but with that pizza oven, because it can do grilled cheese in 30 seconds, not four to five minutes if you're on a flat top, was what I really liked about that grilled cheese that we could, we could do it that way. So uh, don't be afraid to not sell it for six when you can get more again when you're adding bacon or ham or Swiss or other things with it for theirs you can definitely do that organic options so I'm going a little bit this is the, I'm talking I'm sure you're talking a little bit about healthier foods too um, I have I don't again anything that you do that is that you can when you're going to do something like organic make sure you tell the guest put it in the menu I see this all the time that they're like is your hamburger fresh? I go, yeah, well, you need to tell them, <laughs> let them know. Because as a customer, we always think we're getting frozen garbage, right? Hey, no, we have fresh Angus beef burgers. Okay, great. That already knows that's, well, that's why you're charging 1095 for that. Okay, I get it, right? So can you do it with organics? Yes, just be, let people know our stuff is organic and people know stuff's more expensive than it's organic. So, um, so that can be really helpful for you. If I'm a hard associate, so they mention our food on our profile page, with that it it definitely will if you've got a good experience with it right as we were talking about if you're offering organic products fresh ground beef fresh burgers a burger night you know a cold pork night or even doing a fried chicken night at one of our locations um so yes in fact i think it's important to advertise because people do shop before they get there and they go oh man we were gonna i didn't know you guys had burger night tonight right so definitely doing that communication i think can be really really helpful so Oh, these are great questions. I love this. Um, someone posted in the chat portion, what are your thoughts on a menu for wineries? Yeah, we so the, the wineries that we've worked with on this, um, the, you know, the easiest option to add, the, the two easiest options to add is, is the grill option because I go to the counter and I hand you the bun lettuce and tomato and then you go out to the grill and, and pick your food up. So I'm separating the proteins and that's how we move the line so quick. We have a grill operation that can do 9,000 an hour. Okay, we tested it at a farm. And, and so we got to test this with seven POS. That's how we did it. Seven POS and a fresh grill outside. And then we were doing fresh chicken tender. That same menu I showed you the, with the five items was orchestrated out of that grill operation. And we did 9,000 an hour or 72,000 on a day. Um, and the average wait time was 12 minutes. So not, not, a, not a long wait for everything that was going on. We had 5,000 people there and, and uh, over 40% of the people went through our grill line that day to eat. So it's, it's doable. It just has to be set up a certain way to do that. Um, but I think that, that having, having these operations, you know, in that way can be super successful for you. So I'm going to mention the food on the page. So, so yeah, just having, you can definitely put the menu even on there. 
but just make sure you explain and express all the good things that you're doing with it. Someone um, we have related to that, in your opinion, is the market growing for healthier options in a farm-based experience or folks using it, looking for an excuse to eat junk? I think that it's kind of both. Part of it is I'm on vacation and I get to go eat whatever I want, wherever I want, and I want to eat it, right? So part of it is like, I'm, go I'm going to go to seven barbecue places because that's what we're doing on our trip. Um, there are, though, the people are, it is very difficult to get on the road and find vegan products. My wife is vegan. So we, we struggle with this all the time. You know, that I, I know what I want to eat. I know what she wants to eat. So we have to go find that mix to make that work. So is it nice to have vegan options? Absolutely. And, you know, it doesn't just have to be hummus and chips, right? It can be other, other parts. Or if you do a hummus plate, like make it look really cool with three different colors on it and, and really sell it because then they, they will be your best promoters of going, look what I just got at this place. Because it's not just hummus in a bowl with carrots and celery. You know, that's not very exciting. So dress it up, play with it a little bit, make it more of an experiential plate. And I think that it can, I think it can work. Um, but again, you need to let people know, and especially that you know that there's a customer base that's coming for that, then educate them and say, hey, we've got some really good vegan options for you or vegetarian options if they're if you're staying in the dairy mode. Looking back through some of the folks who are joined, we have a distillery, a winery, an orchard. It looks like a lot of businesses who probably just have people coming in for the day, not necessarily. Yeah. That that pizza piece is where, you know, so the winery that we did, we we held on the grilled operation. We did the pizza operation just for the simplicity of execution. Um, we've learned that we can train 14 year olds to make these pizzas. So we only, and the investment was basically 22 grand. I need a pizza table. I need a warmer and I need the pizza oven, right? So those are the three pieces I need a cutting table and, and all, but that's not a big deal. So for 22, 20, a little bit over 20, you're in the pizza business. And that really helped the winery part about because of making they were making charcuterie boards and they were making these things that took a long, really long time to produce. And then they, you know, they make 15 of them and one day they'd sell three. And so they'd make eight the next day and the next day they'd sell 30. And then they'd get stuck with these long, intensive layouts. That's why I'm saying specialty for like four or five people at a nice winery with like a whole little private wine tasting for $250. Right, that includes a, a pizza and all that with it is and just and you only you know you only sell five of them you know a day or three of them a day right so i think there's some great things that you can do around wine tasting as well especially there and i really if i was going to pick i would pick the pizza off because it's the easiest one to do the success of what we heard back from the client on that was through the roof they they their food sales and wine sales used to be 95 5 it's now 75 25 and their wine sales are up 30 percent so do the math on that, about the increase of what they did. Pretty neat. Um, protein is both organic. When harvest hosts take a portion of our food sales, if we start selling food. I can, I can take that question if you want. So, so I believe there are a couple of hosts on today, but if you're not a harvest host currently, um, the way the platform works is 100% of the profits made on site go back to you. So if you were interested in getting started with some type of food and beverage program, anything that the members that are staying on site would spend with you, you get those profits. So all yours. There you go. Nice. And in the chat, someone said, what are your thoughts on chicken salad options? <laughs> Well, um, I will tell you the magic secret that I heard from a chef about making the best chicken salad ever. Um, and that is take your chicken salad recipe, which frankly is pretty dull. If you really think about it, it doesn't have a lot of flavor to it. Um, and add orange marmalade. Orange marmalade, never thought it would rock the world. And he crushed it with that. So um, if you're thinking about chicken salad, try the orange marmalade piece. As a concept of its own piece, look, it's a sandwich, right? Like any, like in that in that realm, I get a little scared in sandwich world because of, because of what I see with Subway and the places that are doing, you know, a busy Subway does it three or four hundred thousand a year, maybe a half million. So, which means they're only doing about fifteen hundred a day, and and which isn't bad. There's nothing wrong with that. It's just that the volumes that we do at most of the places that are higher higher volume sandwiches won't work. Um, unless we have them all set. That's why we do the full pork sandwich, you know, so, um, but nothing wrong with chicken salad. Um, if you're, if that's, you know, just a thing that you're doing on top of your menu, but try the orange marmalade and see what you think. That's awesome. 
Uh, I have two more questions that came in the chat. Uh, Terry asked if Harvest Host was a single night. Yes, it's a single night stay. You know, we're jumping back and forth here in between both brands. Harvest Host is just a one night stay. Um, no hookups or any services, just a place to park for one night. So it's a good opportunity to capture some extra revenue. If you have food on site, they might come and park for the night and have dinner and you know they'll roll out the next morning. Um, and then Kim asked, we have a wedding venue that we also do a fall festival in October. We have, some catering, we have a catering prep kitchen and not sure how to grow our kitchen during our fall festival, but keeping it simple during weddings during the rest of the year. Um, I, it's definitely doable because if you've got that, that catering kitchen puts you in the ability to service um, many more items than just pre-made products. So um, I, again, the, the first one, the, the grill and the, and the pizza are the two best. Um, and what I mean by the grill is the, is, you know, being able to do the, you, the reason we do the bun lettuce and tomato inside is because the health department wants a, 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 a uh, covered space where we're serving prep products. But the burger at the fresh grill comes off at 40 degrees, goes onto the grill and comes off at 140. And that's how we're able to fresh grill outside. That's We pulled it off in 50 states. If you have an issue with your health department, give us a call. We'll take you through the rules. You can't just put an ice chest out there and a grill that you got at Home Depot. It's not going to work. You have to have, you know, NSF approved equipment. You have to have the proper refrigeration to do this. So don't just stick a grill out there because you will get you will get cut off but there's ways to do it. And again, send us an email, Mike at propfulfood.com and we'll, we can go through this process. But yeah, you've got a good opportunity to grow this piece um, from your fall business and your wedding business. And there's ideas about the wedding business piece too, that we wanna make sure you get all the revenue out of that too. So reach out and ask some more questions there. Awesome. Well, those are all the questions we have. Does anybody else have anything else they'd like to ask? I know we're we're well beyond an hour at this point, but what a great conversation and great questions we've had. So really appreciate the participation from the attendees. Thanks everybody. Awesome. And we'll be sending out the recording. So if anybody wants to share, they're welcome to share this out with the rest of their you know, teams at your prospective businesses. Um, if you have questions for Mike, feel free to reach out to him. Um, do you wanna type that in the chat, Mike, so they're able to copy your email down correctly? Um, I can also put, if anybody has more questions about Harvest Host, you can reach out to our team at listings at harvesthost.com. I'll put that in the chat. Um, we're very grateful for everybody being here today and hope we answered some great questions and got your brains thinking a little bit. Um, any other last questions before we close out for the day? Well, thanks everybody. Thanks for uh, jumping on board and, and being a part of this. So, uh, and look forward to helping you in any way we can. Great. Thank you so much, everybody. Have a great day.